Herndon, and my revolutionary idea is that private enterprise is an effective alternative to charity. I'm a PhD student in the economics department at Manderson Business School. Last summer, I worked in India for an organization called Seva Mandira. My initial project was going to be applying econometrics to agricultural price data, but that fell by the wayside when I started to realize the wider social impact that some of their businesses were having. So instead, I wound up writing two articles for the London School of Economics. One was about a food processing mill in a very impoverished area, and the second was about a clothing manufacturer that only employs women in rural India. And I hope in the course of the next 15 minutes or so, I can convey my sense of optimism and excitement for what businesses are doing to improve people's lives in the developing world. It seems like every financial newspaper features breathless coverage of India's economic growth. And it's hard not to get taken in by bricks and Bollywood. The chief executive officers of Microsoft, Pepsi, and Google were all born in India. A few years ago, when the Prime Minister visited New York City, he spoke to the United Nations and then to a sold out crowd at Madison Square Garden. You probably haven't heard of Udaipur. It's a city in the far western state of Rajasthan, just on the edge of the Thar Desert. 450,000 people. It is dusty and bustling and flying headlong into the future. When I was there last summer, it seemed like everyone was talking on a cell phone while speeding on a motor scooter and somehow dodging the ubiquitous cattle. But take the road just outside of town, and pretty quickly you will find yourself in rural South Asia. The trousers turn to dhotis. The English and the Hindi fades into Mewari a language that is the last vestige of an ancient princely state. The ethnically Aryan North Indians are replaced by a much older people, an indigenous tribal population known as the field. The female literacy rate is 40%. 80% of children are anemic. Now, for the last 50 years, Seva Mandir has been doing incredible work to improve every aspect of human well-being in rural Udaipur district. Their employees and volunteers are nurses and researchers, teachers and administrators who work every day to improve local governance, health care, women's rights, agriculture. And all that is exactly what you would expect and hope from an idealistic and effective charity. But in the last few decades, they've started doing something else. They're starting businesses. And tonight, I want to make the case that these small businesses are the best hope for improving people's lives in the developing world. You take the highway just west out of Udaipur, and pretty quickly, you will find yourself in Kodra. That is a county that is home to 230,000 people, almost entirely rural, poor, and field. Practically every family is dependent on its male members to migrate seasonally to some big city just to survive. It's a hard place to make a living. And one of the few crops that they can grow is something called dal. It is a plant that provides most of the protein in a vegetarian diet. In 2009, Seva Mandir opened up a dal processing mill in Kodra. They solicited a token donation of 100 rupees from 86 farmers. That's about $1.50. They got the mill up and running, and they called it an informal cooperative. In all but name, they had created a small, closely held corporation where the owners elected a board to oversee the business on their behalf, and they took an interest because they were entitled to a share of the profits in the form of dividends. When people talk about collective action that empowers disadvantaged groups, that's exactly what this is. 
I spoke to the farmer who owns this plot of land just behind the mill. He told me that since it arrived, he's been spared the time and expense of renting a truck for the 35 kilometer trek, hauling his crop to the nearest market. And he still calls his old connection before he sells to the mill. He's going to make sure he's getting the best price. Now, I didn't ask, but he volunteered that he apply no fertilizer to his all-natural organic crops. That strains credulity for anyone who is familiar with India's very generous system of fertilizer subsidies. But I can forgive him for telling me what he thinks I want to hear. Because India's politicians are all too eager to promise far too much to their farmers. See, the poverty that is endemic to Kodra is not a result of government inaction. India's politicians are very active, but it's in the form of a short-sighted and irresponsible populism. Fertilizer subsidies that do more for graft than for growth. Debt relief, just in time for elections, that utterly distorts the functioning of their credit markets. Their resistance to foreign retailers prolongs a defective supply chain that allows far too many fruits and vegetables to rot before they can get to market. Now, they're very active when it comes to grand schemes that are allegedly helping farmers. But by and large, they fail to ensure that the people who own plots of land like this don't even have formal legal title to their land. So when he wants to lease a tractor or hire some more workers, he can't use his property as collateral on a loan. Sangam Mandir doesn't market itself as a startup innovator. They started with the intent of helping people. This was just the most effective way they found to do it. It's a startup where throughput has shot from 800 to 70,000 kilograms in the last eight years. And they want to keep growing. That's why this fall, they're legally separating from Sava Mandir to become a private entity so they can keep growing and keep working with local banks. The man in charge of that is the president of the board. And I met him one day at the mill when he was signing paperwork that would allow them to draw more power from the local electricity grid. I asked him, what is the biggest change that you've seen in India in your lifetime? He didn't talk about politics or pop culture but about how an entrepreneurial mindset is driving a shift from subsistence to commercial farming, and how that's chipping away at some very long-running injustices across India. To give just one example, in a society that is this diverse and this unequal, few topics are more contentious than affirmative action. The mill's employees are almost entirely veal because there is no one else around to hire. And they're doing more for the veal than a whole lot of government programs have done since 1947. This is Chochi. She grew up in a hillside village in rural Rajasthan. Her childhood was spent gathering firewood and plowing fields. That came to a rather abrupt end when she was 15, and her marriage was arranged to a man she never met in a nearby village called Delvaro. A few years later, her husband was waylaid by a chronic illness, unable to work, and had left that young family with escalating medical bills and no way to pay them. So Choti took a job as a seamstress for a company called Sadna. At that time, it was an in-house women's empowerment project run by Seva Mandir. You see, working from home, stitching and sewing, was just about the only employment option for a woman in Del Mar where they still maintain a practice of women's seclusion and isolation, known as purga. And the peace rates that she would make were not going to make her family rich. But what they could do was bring along a very generous benefits package that included health insurance. Her husband eventually recovered, but Chokey was now the one making more money, so she decided she was going to keep working. Funny how the dynamic changes. She became a group leader, responsible for picking up garments from the cutting department and distributing it to other women in her village. Without that experience, she probably would not have, appro have approached Del Lara's village head in 2000 to demand he do something about the one water pump that only worked for 30 minutes a day. 
Now, for those of you that don't know, in most of the developing world, drawing water is women's work. The village head dismissed her out of hand. So Chozi rounded up a few dozen women and children, marched off to the national interstate just outside the village, and blockaded it. The ensuing traffic jam was so bad that the district magistrate arrived that day to figure out what was going on. Probably not a coincidence that pretty soon there were about a dozen pumps in Del Mar. Now, Chozi's civil disobedience embodies the very best Gandhian principles of nonviolent resistance. But Sadna was still not immune from more practical concerns. They were losing money year after year. So in 2004, Sabre Man here cut them off to sink or swim as a private entity. The harsh accountability of the marketplace demanded greater attention to detail and more flexibility for the seamstresses. When an order for a major Indian retailer took too long, they were forced to sit on finished inventory for an entire year before they could try to sell it again. They also needed better marketing. Choti was outgoing, charismatic, and had transcended turban. She became the face of the company in distant cities like Mumbai. In 2006, over her husband's objections, she brought Sadna's clothing to Lahore, Pakistan, as part of a wider Indian peace initiative. Two years later, and completely alone, she brought them to London at a global exhibition. She told me on the flight over there, she was cramming English clothing jargon like red, and yellow, medium, small. She sold everything she brought, handled all the billing herself. Now, Chosi's story is one of the most wonderful things I encountered in India, but it represents something wider that is happening for women in the developing world. No one knows that better than the CEO of Sadhana. She spent 20 years as a chartered accountant in Bangalore. She's a hard businesswoman, but there's no questioning her determination to aid women. She's helped more than a few of her employees escape physical abuse by moving them into short stay homes. But she also knows that she can only help women by helping Sana. When her, when her employees approached her to ask for a regular salary, she told them no. Because for now, their small scale means they can't afford to carry inventory. They're only going to produce clothing for orders they have on hand. She runs a small business that is labor intensive and she has to have a disciplined, flexible workforce. She told me her ideal employee is either widowed, divorced, or married to an unsupportive husband. They do an annual recruiting drive Women are required to attend four meetings before they are paid a single rupee. And those health benefits that help Chuchi so much, today they're only arriving after a one year probationary period. Now I know that doesn't sound warm and fuzzy, but it allows Sadna to operate and experiment and grow without being beholden to some politician's whims or some foreigner's good intentions. Last year, negotiations with a major European retailer fell through. Because remember, these women are all working from home. That is their only option for about 95% of them. And most of them don't mind because it lets them watch their children during the day while they're working. But that makes it impossible for Sadna to 100% guarantee that there was no child labor involved in their products. So the European retailer cut them off and they lost out in a humongous amount of sales. And while I'm sure they meant well, there are about three or four dozen other Chotis that didn't get their opportunity because foreigners did not understand the trade-offs involved in local social and economic conditions. Now, labor exploitation is an awful reality we all rightly abhor, but that is not the case here. These women are stitching and sewing at home because their alternative isn't teaching in a nursery or being a secretary or even plowing the field. It is isolation in Perto. Now, no one forgets their original mission to empower women. That's something that allowed Choti to grow from an illiterate child bride 
into a woman who paid for both of her children's college tuition out of her earnings. But that only continues to happen if we remain pragmatic about how the world actually works. Sada understands better than anyone that in the words of MIT economist Esther Duflo, neither economic development nor women's empowerment is the magic bullet it's sometimes made out to be. Realism needs to temper the positions of policymakers on both sides. <coughs> Nothing is more accountable than a private business forced to compete for customers. There is no affirmative action more concrete than a successful business owned and operated by members of a minority group. And there is no women's empowerment more compelling than a wife who out-earns her husband. Everyone I've ever met at this university, in some way or another, what they say is that when I leave here, I want to make a difference. Now that can mean something different to each of us. I understand that. But I hope that when you really think about it, the foundation of human flourishing isn't the nobility of your ideals or the purity of your intentions, but we make the world a better place by offering other people something of value. When you leave here tonight and when you leave this university and you ask, how can I make a difference? How can I make the world better? I'd ask you to think about doing it by making a profit. 